Yo, have you heard of LinkedIn Learning? If you haven't, LinkedIn Learning is an American massive open online course provider. It provides video courses taught by industry experts in a variety of subjects. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because Living Corporate is in partnership with LinkedIn Learning to provide diversity, equity, and inclusion courses. Listen, if you're trying to be a better ally, you want to understand better diversity, equity, inclusion strategies, or you just want to learn how to be a better leader, you got to check out the courses on LinkedIn Learning. So check it out. You can do it one of two ways. You can click the link in the show notes or you go to LinkedIn Learning and you search Living Corporate. Again, link in the show notes or go to LinkedIn Learning and search Living Corporate. I'll see you over there. We have a very engaging topic for you today that we will reveal momentarily. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about our show. Living Corporate is a digital media network consultancy focused on workplace equity and inclusion. Living Corporate centers and amplifies black and brown voices in the workplace through digital media production and business to business consulting. The network offers a variety of programming, and tonight we are excited that you've joined us for our latest installment. Now, the Access Point itself is a weekly webinar focused on preparing black and brown college students and early career professionals for the workforce by having the real nuanced talks that they do not know that they need. For this Thursday night iteration of the show, we will focus more closely on real challenges that you, our viewers, are facing as you move through the early stages of your career. So we welcome your stories, experiences, and questions, and look forward to equipping you with the strategies to mitigate these challenges. And as always, before we get started, I want to allow my co-hosts to introduce themselves. So Wendy, we will start with you. Hello, I am Dr. Wendy M. Edmonds. I am an author, consultant, and I am a professor at Bowie State University. And your job is your treasure. I help you separate the gems from the counterfeits. Wonderful, Lonnie. Good evening, good evening. I am Dr. Lonnie Morris, and like Wendy Edmonds, I am a management consultant and professor. I spent, excuse me, I spent my time helping working professionals at critical points in their career unpack organizational issues, find meaning behind them, and develop strategies for resolution. There are two things that are important to me. One is making the world of work a better place, and two is helping you hate your job less. Excellent. And I am Deborah Hunter Johnson. I'm an attorney and also a workplace culture consultant. My goal is to help you accelerate your wisdom curve. I want you to help you achieve your goals faster and more fully. So with that, let's turn to our topic. Wendy, I think you're going to kick it off for us. I am. Let's think about this. How many times have you heard you have to be twice as good and get half as much? Or you got to work hard in order to go far? Good is not enough. You've got to be great. So I grew up military and, and I heard it in my house a lot. And my dad always drilled in us to make sure that no matter what you do, it's got to be your best. It's like everybody has to recognize that that is your best. And if it means cleaning the floor, they had better be able to eat off of it. So that's the kind of level of work ethic that you have to have all the time. The black and brown professionals experience nuanced cultural ideas that encourage us to work um, to have that strong ethic. But our relationship with hard work uh, ethic can fit into a wide spectrum. There's two sides to that coin. So some of you might experience hard work as a challenge stressor. And what do I mean by that? That's like a large workload, it, it, um, additional responsibilities. Time pressure is is really something that motivates you. Uh, that is what you thrive off of as a high achiever. And so with that, that's that's what gets you excited about work and energizes you. You're driven by those deeply uh, 
personal outcomes, those goals that you set. Then there's the flip side to that point, where others may find those types of things, you know, as, as a motivator. The other side, which is the hindrance stressors, that just totally depletes motivation. So they're experiencing hard work um, and, and they're resenting it. They're resenting it because they're overwhelmed, nearing burnout because of what is expected as the hard work. Now, especially if you're in an environment, if you're in an environment and, and there's role ambiguity, that's a, that's a hindrance stressor. Uh, lots of red tape, company politics, all of those things just take away from what your excitement for going to work is all about. Now, one of the things that I find interesting, though, is how your experience in working um, can evolve, and in, in especially in comparing college life with the workplace. Lonnie, can you share a little more on that? Well, I think it's a, a tad bit interesting, right? Because the college space is a little unique in that you've got well-packaged itineraries, what you can do, pretty much driven by your course syllabi. And you know, for these eight weeks, you've got eight week course or 14 weeks, I'm working on this particular goal and then it ends. And then you start a new one in the next class on a new term. So and you know what to do. You know what the milestones are. You know what, how to achieve the desired outcome. That's not always the same when we move into the workplace. It's not. It really isn't. It's, it's different. And even thinking about, you know, you never walk in anywhere, right, where everything is just handed to you like in a, a syllabus, where everything you're going to do is right here. And even the rubric is there, how we're going to measure you. Everything is all in one place. It just doesn't happen. You think that? I agree with you. I think that the college experience is very structured. You know, on average, it's four to six years. You know, the start date of the semester, the end date of the semester, you know, when the spring break is, you know, when spring break is. <laughs> and there is a pattern to it. And then there is sort of an, an exit hatch also. I can remember my first year of practicing law because I went straight through school nonstop. So my first real significant full-time permanent position was as a law firm associate. And I can remember starting after the bar exam in August and then by December feeling a little itchy like, you know, I'm ready for this semester to be over. <laughs> I'm ready to take my exams and turn in my books and, and start fresh. Yeah. And that didn't happen. And that was very stressful to me to have to now navigate mm -hmm. a world workplace that was never ending every single day. It felt like a huge commitment to me. Mm -hmm. I need to be here every day, same time, same place. <laughs> and as a, it, it was a huge commitment. I've never made that commitment to anybody for mm -hmm. any you know, permanently. And so that itself in the early stages of your career, just knowing there's no end in sight to this, there's no Christmas break, there's no exit hatch with the new semester can be very daunting. But I will also share that in this space of maintaining healthy boundaries, the people that I am more concerned about are these you know, we used to call them type A personalities, but now we recognize every personality has it in them. It just depends on what the trigger is that are grinding, working to achieve. They have goals. They have three or four jobs. They might have their corporate job. They have two or three side hustles, plus they're networking. Plus, they're on social media, which is telling you, you should be living your best life and firing on all cylinders every single day. You can sleep when you're dead. And <laughs> that in and of itself creates a whole other set of issues that can lead to having unhealthy, unhealthy boundaries in your job and in what you do. Finding your fit. It, it, it's a struggle. It is. It is. Because the world is telling us we can do it all. 
Mm-hmm. We should be doing it all. If you're not doing it all, you're lazy. You know, if you're not grinding day and night, drinking your energy drink, doing what you have to do, you know, to hustle, you can feel like a slacker. So there's competition in it as well. Because how many of you, because I do this too, people ask you, how are you doing? Oh, I've just been so busy. <laughs> you know, if you come kind of in, you know, to say you're busy and well, I'm talk making about it. all the things you have to do. You know, and how stressed out you are. It's kind of a badge of honor in the U.S. to do that. Mm-hmm. So here we are with a culture that's probably not very healthy in terms of maintaining boundaries in the workplace. And sometimes you it's driven by... You see on the academic side, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's driven by our own beliefs around that too, right? You've mm-hmm. got, as you mentioned, Wendy, it's from your family coming up saying, hey, here's how you're supposed to work. Here are the examples you saw in your parents and the other elders in your family, your older sister, your older brother who went to college before you. So you saw everyone working all the time, sort of this nonstop clock, and and people internalize that. Here's I've got to prove something to my parents, or I've got to I've got to break the 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 cycle for my family. I've got to prove this teacher wrong who thought I wasn't good enough. I don't <laughs> want to be a statistic. All those things. And remember when we first started the pandemic. And there was all this talk Ooh. about if you haven't started a business during this time. You are a slacker. Like, well, wait, this is my this right. is the time I need to break. Right. Right? I need this time right. to finish. That's right. And Lonnie, life. you raise a good point because many of us come from, you know, parents and grandparents that may have had jobs they didn't love. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. physical jobs, jobs that were outside, mm-hmm. jobs that were in service to others in a menial way. So it's not like they skipped back into the house excited to share about their day. Right. It felt like a grind. So it sometimes feels hard for us in the spaces that we are in the jobs that we do to complain to family or to suggest that you're tired or you're fatigued and you need a break because they worked hard for us to be in these spaces and would have welcomed an opportunity to you know, have the work environments that we did. So you often can't even admit that you might feel stress or feel that you've kind of crossed the line into unhealthy boundaries with work. Oh yeah. My my nana didn't want to hear that. She she no. couldn't really make the connection between the college degree and then the master's degree and the PhD. She just knew the baby got some some degrees. <laughs> He's doing some work. I don't understand it. I don't know about it. And if somebody asks me if you're a doctor, yes. If you sick, call Lonnie, right? That's for the year. <laughs> Can't help you there. <laughs> That's just sort of how it was internalized yeah. for the family. Right. And so the, mm-hmm. the nuances that we experience now, and particularly with all the things you mentioned, Deborah, and how, how we work and we are always working in right. multiple ways, not just at the job. And then we come home and we work and we do different things. So it's a different space than the people who help get us to those places. That's right. I even think so. What are oh, okay? Go, go ahead. ahead, Wendy. No, I, was I think you're about say, to go into some of the themes. So please yeah. go ahead and start that. Yeah, you know, um, we even think about changing jobs is not respected always. Is not looked upon as a good thing, especially from traditionalists like my parents and in that right because you get your job, you stay with your job, you retire from that job. But we leave for different reasons. And uh, there's an article, a recent article in this CN, uh, CNBC about the great resignation. And this is what's happening as a result of the pandemic. So the pandemic changed everything. Uh, pre-pandemic, you know, we, we dropped the children off to school and then the parents went off to work and then that was reversed in the evening. When the pandemic hit, everyone was in the space. The children were in the space, parents were in the space, and responsibilities were still um, the same. School, right? Homeschooling, you still had to be required to, to go to work. And the difference was you didn't have the commute. You went from That's right. work, was in another room or in another space in the house. So that kind of blurred the lines as to the expectations, either from you as the employee or the employer towards you. 
And so I can't tell you how many times I had um, clients that said, you know, I am not really liking this feeling where um, I have to be on camera all the time. They are measuring my productivity by how long I'm on my computer, what I'm doing on my computer. If there's no movement on my computer, it's going to shut me down. I have to log back in. I don't like the fact that um, it's almost like punching a clock because I have to log in at a certain time to show that I'm in this space and available at this time. It left no flexibility, no flexibility for the children who are in the home that you now had to help uh, with their classwork, coursework, online work. All of this was, was new to them. Um, and so when you think about um, pre having a preference to flexibility, we had a taste of that. And so now, why go back to the community? Why are we doing this? That that whole use of technology has burned them out. All of that that we say, oh, more, 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 let's learn more, let's do more, it's overdone. So now CNBC did, did a report, and I just want to say that the article states that 95% of workers are now considering changing jobs, and 92% are even willing to switch industry to find the right position. Because now that they've adjusted, they like the way that that feels, and they want to continue that. That says a lot to me about burnout. It does. Absolutely. And I am a part of a, a think tank with the foundation, Wendy, that's looking at that very issue. Um, and, uh, it's with the Texas Women's Foundation here in Dallas, Texas. And we're focused on stopping the slide because we've seen the statistics about how many women are leaving the workforce. And whereas 10 years ago, and I think I've shared this statistic before, the number one concern about workers was compensation. Now it's flexibility. That is the number one reason why people are changing jobs, leaving the workforce, or feeling burned out. So, Wendy, you are spot on. Lonnie, what do you see as some of the issues and themes with, with this topic today? Well, I think one of the ways that sort of this, this grind can get out of hand is sometimes with abuse of power in the workplace. And it doesn't always present as abuse. When we think about how it's really defined, we think about if someone's misusing their authority towards people that work with them or work for them, and it's having a negative impact on what the results should be. Sometimes we see it called malfeasance, right? So it might show up as what is maybe this subtle sort of harassing and bullying about you can do more or hey, or sometimes people are, it's sort of the fake support. Look at Lonnie Go, he's got another project on his plate, right? So it's sort of they're pretending to support, sort of gaslighting you, knowing that you're continuing to take on more and more. It might be people interfering with your efficiency, right? So if you're, you're managing multiple things and you've got, what's that, the old adage, you've got so many pots on the on the stove, but <laughs> nothing's really cooking well. So you got all these things you're trying to get, but you can't really get to do it. And it has this incredible impact, right? It creates high stress. Uh, we talked mm -hmm. about turnover. We've seen people leaving, right? This great resignation. Um, sometimes it can create this hard, it's hard for you to concentrate because you've got so many things percolating in your mind about the other projects you have to do, the competing deadlines, competing priorities, and trying to find balance and all of that. Now, granted, Sometimes it's industry specific, right? Or field specific. Deborah, as an attorney, I read all these things about, there's something last week talking about the new attorneys coming out, going to the top firms are making over $250,000 as new associates, but they're expected to work 60 to 80 hours. That's just part of the deal, right? So I think there's some things to can consider there. Absolutely. I think anyone in um, the legal field consulting, you know, Companies that are 24 seven environments where mm -hmm. people are working all day and all night. Yeah. Um, though it's challenging to find that balance. And in fact, 
you know, some years ago, there was an acronym um, coined to describe the VUCA world that we live in, V-U-C-A, mm -hmm. and it stands for a world that's volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous. And there was a time many, many decades ago where you would have periods of the world being VUCA. Something might happen and then things would settle down and smooth over. But with technology, we don't have that anymore. We are always in spaces of volatility, unpredictability, mm. um, com very complex and very ambiguous. So it's and like the workplace pandemic, right? It's yeah. never going Yes. Away. Right. right. The, the oh, whole God. world, when you think about at any given time, there's always some crisis going on. Climate change that affects the weather, mm -hmm. COVID affecting supply chain. These are things that are going to exist for yeah. the foreseeable future. Yeah. And so we all have to almost change our mindset and stop waiting for things to calm down yeah. and realize this is going to be it. For the foreseeable future. And I can't tell you how much technology has really increased the stress levels. In some ways, it, it made work easier and created an overlap between your personal life and your professional life. And as we all know, then you don't have those boundaries. Yeah. So you get the emails all through the day, long after the, the traditional workday is ended. The same thing with text messages. And there is a, a Apple executive that coined this phrase called continuous partial attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are constantly in a state of checking a text, checking an email. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a ping, there's a beep, there's a buzz. And it's very different than multitasking where I do this and then I come over and do this. You are constantly interrupted by technology and it affects your brain's ability to perform yes. because when you are distracted from writing an email because you look at a text and then there's an alert and mm -hmm. on and on and on and then you get back to the email you were working on 10 minutes before it takes a moment to pick up the thread of your thought to remember what you were doing and they they call that attention residue mm -hmm. you kind of have this residue that exists when you keep getting distracted and it slows your productivity down because you have to keep refocusing. Yeah. And that's the world we live in. It's hard to that's, tell somebody not to do it because it, that's the world we live in. Yeah, it says a lot about multitasking. It doesn't work. I don't I don't even like it when um I'm in a meeting and we're trying to have a meeting and someone else is tending to uh, another email or shuts the screen off and they're on another call and everyone's waiting. And by the time we get back to the meeting, the next person has another call. I, and I, I, I tell you, I have learned to, to realize that you cannot uh, multitask. It doesn't work. It doesn't and work. And I, I see it with clients sometimes, coaching clients who will call me with a legitimate issue. Hey, Lonnie, I need to talk to you about something. But they are, as you mentioned, Deborah, they are drawn to the text message that's coming through from their coworker or their boss or email. So while they're trying to get some information from me that they need, they can't even can, they can't even finish the question because they're trying to read the text that just came in the email. And I would, would you like to call me back? No, no, just give me a second. But I don't want to take, I don't want that second, right? I, if you want my energy, I need to be able to give you my undivided attention. So do the same. So it's really hard to break from that. And it contributes to all the things we're talking about. You know, I do some training on bias and talk about microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I list as a microaggression is doing emails while you're in a one on one meeting with a subordinate. And I get a lot of pushback. Come on, talk about that. A lot of companies say, no, take that out. We do not want to describe that because that is what we do as a culture. But we, at its heart, it is disrespectful, disrespectful. when you think about it. Absolutely. What does it say to the person in the room right. that they're not as important? They aren't worthy of your undivided attention. So they're setting the tone, though. The leader 
effort is setting the tone. Think about it. This is and, what that, we and do. that's why we have the great resignation, right? Because the tone right. is being set that it's okay to do this. Right. All right, I'm gonna find some place where that's not okay. They're setting they're setting the tone. Follow what we do. Now, this is the expectation. Whether you like it or not, or agree with it or not, this is the expectation. And there are all, you, you see this a lot uh, with entrepreneurs and um, you know startups. You know, time is money, and so founders will often believe that I'm doing this in furtherance of the greater good. This mm -hmm. multitasking, not giving you my full attention because I'm important and I need to do these things because this is what's going to pay your salary. That's one school of thought, but I've heard from people within those startups how they react to that. Yeah. So I don't think it's just big companies. I think sometimes when we are in positions of power, mm -hmm. along with that comes a sense of privilege and entitlement that we have to be careful about because it could unconsciously send a message that creates an unhealthy workspace for people. Because as you both said, people model behavior from the top. Mm -hmm. And what we know is smart companies play the long game. They are concerned about their employees' mental health and well-being because all the studies show that when employees enjoy their, their work and they feel that if they're in a safe and welcoming place, mm -hmm. they're just more creative and they're more productive. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, what do we do? We, we, I think, fully define the scope and breadth of the problem. What are some of the things that we can do? Why don't you start, Wendy? Sure. I would... I would look at this from, from both sides. Again, um, if we are looking at the organization, the organization is going to have to have some level of flexibility. So in, in a leadership, if they're saying, no, 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 take that out. This is what we do. We, we're setting a tone. We want everybody else to do the same thing. We don't care who's in that seat that you're talking to. This is how we work. But now that the great resignation has has started, think twice and think about that flexibility. So a healthy leader follower dynamic looks like reciprocated um, effort. There's give and take on both sides. So productivity shouldn't be the only metric. Right. Let's look at something other than productivity, because for overachievers, overachievers, any failure is is tragic. It's just a tragedy and recovery takes too long or so long mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. You just have an obligation, whether it's a team lead, um, lead on a project um, or a title for a leadership position, you have an obligation to develop your employees. Think about this. You talked about personality traits earlier, Deborah. When when leaders hire, they look for specific personality traits that they think are valuable to the organization, the extrovert, the one that's agreeable, you know, very social, because they, you know, we we think that that is going to be a good fit for the organization as they move forward with decision making um, and they can handle stress better. But the, the person who isn't the extrovert can also have the same qualities. They just come out differently. And since we know that you can't, you can't fix a personality trait, you can't change that. But what leaders can do is they can contribute to um, helping develop that that individual um, through motivation and encouragement, and that is to develop the psychological capital. And what do I mean by that? So there's four pillars to developing, um, or, or four pillars of psychological capital. That's hope, self-efficacy, there's optimism, and resiliency. 
And armed with this information, wanting to do better, uh, leaders have the, the um, they should be responding to this with positive talent stressors. And you can only do that if you understand and ask the questions from those who are working for you. What does that uh, sharing humanity look like? When a manager comes in and says, hey, hey, how are you? Or what did you like best about a project? Why can't we find that happy space for them to help and encourage them to work in that space? That would be a challenge stressor, right? Well, let's, you, you want to do that? You can be the lead here. You did this well. Why? It should never be, um, a point where you have to um, continue to just pile work on because that person likes doing that. That's where that abuse comes in. Let's just keep pushing that, that work off. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about the psychological capital is that motivating employees, these are some of the suggestions that leaders can do. How about happen, helping the employees to manage their objectives. Don't give them something that is not attainable. Break it down into small pieces so that it's manageable. Celebrate the achievements. Um, there are projects that people spend long hours on, their personal time, right? But there's never ever a celebration in the end. And how about being authentic? Come to work and be real. If you say you're going to do something, be the person of your word and continue uh, to do that. And then I would also say uh, for those who may not be in a leadership position to take control of your own destiny. You take know, control position. of your own destiny. You're absolutely hey, right. Position yourself for success. and. And think about what that looks like for you. So we say, oh, set your goals, keep a journal, write this down. But this goes beyond writing it down. Sometimes you have to close your eyes to just imagine what that looks like for you. What is your destiny? And then find out if you're going to set the goals for five years. What's one of those or how many of those? Two of those. It doesn't matter that you can break down and manage month to month to see movement. That will take away the stress. When you see that the, the stressors are, are piling up, you can separate and say, this doesn't line up with my goal. Lonnie, it reminds me of what you said the other week about your apples. Anything that doesn't fit in, in there to help you move your goal, consider thinking about that, but take charge of your own destiny. I agree with you, Wendy, especially with making these goals actionable, mm -hmm. because I think a piece of that that sometimes we forget is self-advocacy has to be a part of that. Yes. Because you have, in order to really navigate through life successfully, you have to be able to speak up for yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a job and your boss is letting your workload pile up and get overloaded, you have to have that conversation. And sometimes people are uncomfortable doing it because they feel like they'll again look like they're a slacker. They look like the person who's always saying no. You can say yes with a big but on it. I'd be happy to help you, but let's sit down and look at my workload and prioritize it and decide what order we should do things. Because there are going to be some things that will have to be delayed if you want this to go to the top of the list. Prioritization or providing them an alternative solution. I may not be the best person for this because everything I have going on, maybe we can have a team meeting and look at workloads and see who might be the best person for this. It but also self shifts the responsibility. Where it should be. Yeah. Because... One tool I think everybody has to have in their toolkit is they have to recognize they have to manage their boss and make their boss do their job. 
because the boss's job is to clear the clutter, cut through the bureaucracy so the team can excel. But some managers haven't been trained with that lens. And as an employee, you have to recognize my manager is essentially a tool for me in the workplace to help me get what I need to get done. And I should be able to go for them, advice, counsel, strategic direction, uh, navigating the politics, all of those things. And many times we sit back and wait for the boss to offer when we really have to go in and negotiate. So I once I started looking at things through that lens, it took out a lot of the stress because I felt like it gave me more control mm-hmm. over things. And what I see with high achievers and people who maybe pile their plates too full is that they have to kind of unpack some of those emotional issues attached with that, some of the ego that that is going with constantly taking on more and more and more and get to the root cause of it. Because a lot of it is pride and ego. You know, I want to show the world that I can do this younger than anybody else or twice as great. And that's okay if you're going to live to see it happen. But if you burn out either physically or mentally because of the stress you pile on, is it worth it? So sometimes we have to personally do that work to understand how did I get myself in this situation once again where I'm supposed to be at five places at the same time? And nobody forced me to do it. This was self-imposed. As my pastor calls it, sin, self-inflicted nonsense. (laughs) You brought it on yourself. So let me tell you why it's funny you mentioned your pastor, because I'm sitting here thinking this is just like church. I think Deborah is speaking to me because this is my life. Right. Because I was on that same path. I was a VP at 26 and I was taking, oh, I can do, I can do, I can do. I'm the youngest. I can show, I can show. And crashed. Uh, yes. Crashed. And many times adversity creates the change, the renaissance. That oh, yeah, we never did that need. again. I mean, <laughs> we all know we humans are more motivated by adversity than positivity. Mm-hmm. So we all can use adversity to start anew which you did, Lonnie. So that's good. So unpacking that ego, the emotions behind where you are is really important to self-regulate the behavior. And one thing I find that is helpful to me to regulate just on a daily basis, because I'll wake up with my mind spinning with a bunch of things or at the end of the day, and you've got to get that stuff out of your head. And to-do lists Mm -hmm. are helpful because they will keep you on point about what are your priorities for the day. So when the pings happen, the text, the email, the phone call, people trying to shift the priorities, you won't be like Pavlov's dog and just automatically jump to, you know, the 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 phone call or the text. You can go to your priorities and say, all right, where does this fit in? Do I need to mm-hmm. reorder and keep yourself on track? But if you keep it up in your head, it is impossible to do that. And sometimes it's just noise in your brain that you have to get out. There may be something that you need to do next week and you're keeping it in your frontal lobe because you don't want to forget it. Write it down. So I have many lists. I have things far out that I want to do by the end of the month. And at the end of, you know, end of each week, I'm figuring out what do I need to do for the week? And then I'm breaking it down by the day. Sometimes I have to break it down by the half day because my days may be busy with meetings and other things and I have to find chunks of time. So I'm constantly prioritizing. And I tell a lot of people, whoever masters the calendar will master life because it's all about we've got this chunk of time called our life. (laughs) And how are we going to spend it? I'm gonna and put that on a t shirt for the down. next show. Uh, yes, we have to break Remember Masters it down. the Calendar, Masters Life for the Culture. Yes. Watch, that's watch right. You've got to break it down and figure out how you're gonna spend that time. And that's why I am so impatient with my time being wasted. Mm-hmm. Because you can get money, you can go make more money. But time is such a scarce commodity. 
And we actually really, really don't know how much time we have, right? That's kind of right. the wild card right. in it all. Which is exactly and why I say I, I, I don't like clients calling me saying, hey, I need something, but wait, let me answer this text real quick or let me respond to this email. That's Give me right. your And that can also thing. cause us to overschedule and overcommit yeah. mm-hmm. because we might feel like we're running out of time. And we don't know until we want to get it all in and live each day to, you know, yes, best. But there's a dark side to that without the balance. Definitely a dark side to it. And I think what we're discussing collectively, colleagues, is about empowerment. And there's a lot around this, right? So it's really about self-empowerment. And so self-empowerment is about making a conscious decision to take charge. Doesn't mean you have to be in control of what's happening. You don't have to be the boss. But as you heard Wendy say, as you heard Deborah say, you can take charge of a lot of the moving parts in your space. So that means having the conversations with the folks who are in your management team about what are the tasks that we need to focus on, where are the priorities, who is the best fit for doing what work, identifying the resources that help you get through that. So that means the necess- the resources you need for each task that you have including manpower, right? Who's the best person? Is this in my skill set? Is this a skill I need to develop? Is there someone else who has a more flexible schedule because of their workload that can support this differently than I can at this time? We also mentioned earlier flexibility. It's a big thing right now. And so perhaps it is management by objective. And so tell me what you want as the outcome or the deliverable and give me the autonomy to figure out how to get there. Right. Tell me the dates you need it and what you want and let me figure out the other moving parts that helps create a sense of trust and rapport between you and the other folks that you're working with. There's some other important things about this, I think, speak to sort of what Deborah's saying about taking control of it internally as well. Make positive choices. It can be really, really stressful when you're trying to figure out where my boundaries lie and how I set this this force field around myself not to lose control, but think positive about it, right? Think that most people are have good intentions and that part of sharing the work with you or asking you to take on is because they value your input, they value your skill set, they value your contribution. And while we did start off talking about there might be some abuse of power there, sometimes people don't even recognize that that's what they're doing. Take action in advance. You get to a point in your career, in your organization, where you can see the writing on the wall. I heard it from this meeting. I know a new project's coming. They normally tap me for this, right? So start doing some mitigation early to figure out how can you circumvent some of that. This one, I think, is important and ties to what you were talking about, Deborah, with being mindful about your own practices and what you're doing. Step into your own confidence. When you are dealing with multiple things, you can begin to feel, right? I've got so many pots on the stove. I'm not sure if I'm good. I'm not sure if I fit. I'm not sure if I'm successful with all of these. But remember how you got there, why you got there, and stand in those things with confidence. That's really important to how you see. How you see yourself is how you will see your contributions to the space. We already talked about setting reasonable goals. Right. This is important to your positive space. Surround yourself with positive people. The people who are taking those tasks and saying, all right, I got you. Here's how we're going to break it down and get it done. Not the folks who are receiving the work and thinking, woe is me. What am I going to do? I'm stressed out, right? Because people around you who are stressed will make you feel stressed, even if you aren't experiencing it that way. It makes you feel it differently. Self-care is good. And we already talked about creating a plan and some action. Right. So think about how do I empower myself? And as my colleagues already mentioned, you don't have to wait for someone else to hand you that. Right. You can do a lot of this yourself. Absolutely. I liked what you said about stepping into your confidence. You know, what goes hand in hand with that is gratitude. And that's mm. why it's good sometimes to start cataloging your blessings and writing down your accomplishments. Because sometimes we forget how much we've achieved and how much we've done. 
because we're just going to the next thing on the to-do list. And just, you know, taking that moment to say, you know what? I did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. Feeling pretty good about myself. There's I think it's important recent, to do that. There's a recent study about gratitude that says um, in, if you if you speak and write down all of the things that you are grateful for, it has it has shown to be, have a a more positive impact in your life. Yes. Than counseling. Interesting. That, that was way interesting. So can I can just I tell you a secret grateful. about that? Just can I tell you a secret about that. I'm all with it. So I please do. So I keep a box on my desk with a stack of index cards and a pen by it. And every day I write down the good things that happened on that day and I drop it in that box every day. And when I'm setting my goals for the new year and reflecting on what I want, I take out those things from the whole year and reflect on all the things that happen. Even when bad things happen, I reframe it, right? We talked about staying, making positive choices, staying positive. Right. Even when bad things happen, I take out what was good in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was taken away. Absolutely. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful. It really is. I actually have a gratitude jar in my mm-hmm. family room. And when guests come over, particularly Thanksgiving, different events, I have, I have cards out and I ask people to put something in there and I tell them I'm not going to read it, mm-hmm. but I just want you to put it out there in the universe because I want to have it in my, my house because I think it mm-hmm. creates good energy yeah. just to yeah. know that yeah. I'm surrounded yeah. by people who, you know, are abundantly grateful for their blessings. And it does make a difference, I think. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. Makes a difference. So- and so, you know, I think the point of everything we're saying, because we're looking at things because we are not early stage professionals anymore. We're coming from a place of wisdom and actually sharing things that we wish we had known (laughs) when we were first starting our careers, not to preach, but to say, these are the lessons that we all learn the hard way by hitting rock bottom, being overloaded, being burned out, you know, not feeling great about the work place we were in not feeling that we had that balance and the strategies that we used to uh, get through them and for me it's really try to avoid them there you go so i guess that means it's time for us to toast right so let's toast to being young wisdom boundaries Positivity, empowerment, and all the other stuff that all of you told me today that I wish I would have known 25 years ago. We want you. And the most important thing you said: stepping into your confidence. Stepping into your confidence. Forget that one. He take away. So, and I'm gonna get get another shirt with that one too, right? So, (laughs) cheers to you for your confidence and your boundaries. I'm drinking water as always. Water, lemon. <laughs> oh, I'm being a little on the edge today. I've got lemon ginger tea. So it's getting a little cool here in Texas, right? Yeah. Oh, it's never cool in Texas. <laughs> well, once again, thank you for joining us this evening. And we hope you'll be back with us next week. And bring a friend. Remember, if you have a workplace story, share it with us. We can unpack those things in our next episode. Connect with Living Corporate on our social media channels. For the web, is livingcorporate.tv. On Twitter, we're livingcorp underscore prod. LinkedIn, Living Corporate, or Instagram at Living Corporate. Thank you so much for your time.